Thank you very much. And if I could ask all the speakers to join me on stage, we'll have a, a somewhat a truncated question answer session. Let, let me first let me start out by thanking all of the, the this morning's presenters for what uh, proved to be a very uh, encouraging and educational and interesting uh, session. Um, uh, uh, during the break, actually, Joyce Hillstoner came up and asked me a few questions. So just so that we'll avoid the pregnant pause waiting for someone to be brave enough to raise their hands, I'm going to put Joyce on the spot and ask her to start us out. Well, I have two questions. Uh, maybe there's only time for one, uh, but I guess the one I go first with is looking to, for Mr. Kozlowski and in absentia, Mary Mecklenburg and possibly in present for Richard, um, the trustworthiness of making assumptions about little young blocks of wood and with recent gesso and recent paint. Luckily, Merck talked about using older samples, but how much can we really trust how that reacts uh, compared to large, thin, uh, fragile, uh, panels with much older layers of gesso and paint. And, and I know a lot has been made of the relaxing of the climate control parameters due to some of these findings and just wonder how trustworthy is this assumption. Um, <clears throat> gesso um, and uh, it, it's, it's not aging. I, I mean, we, we, we have been reassured by a specialist, Stefan Mihalski from Canadian Conservation Institute, who said, because we wanted at the beginning to age our specimens by maintaining them at high relative humidity and high temperature, but, uh, but, but the, the experts, especially Stefan, told us that, that historic gesso is very stable and there will be very little difference between aged and, uh, uh, and uh, new, new, new gesso. So that's the short answer. Uh, what is vital is not maybe chemical aging of gesso as a material, but, but that it can contain cracks, the lamination, and so on. So this we would like to tackle uh, within this experimentation. I, I'm more concerned, I suppose, with the wood. Young blocks of young small blocks yes, of but, rather than large, thin, yes. elderly panels. Yes. Uh, the, the young wood was uh, just used as a, as a support to which we apply dimensional change, strain. So uh, it doesn't matter. I, I think we could do the same experiments for even not wooden support because, because our wooden support was just a source of strain to the gesso layer. So it's a an, it's an, it's an kind of mod, model experiment. Now, uh, we believe, I, I think... A, people doing wood research uh, uh, would believe the dimensional response of old and new wood is very similar. I mean, uh, I've tested uh, many uh, historic wood specimens and I don't find uh, the uh, absorption properties and dimensional change properties very different from seasoned new wood. So it can be mechanically very different. It can be damaged by, by some cracks, by, by biological infestation, and so on. But, but as a material, it, it doesn't differ much with time, at least to, 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 to what I find in literature and what I measured. Um, and I can't actually answer your question, Joyce, but what I can tell you is that I, have the same, I share the same concern that you raise with the latter regarding wood. Can't, I'm not involved with gesso. Um, and uh, um, about a year, no, I guess eight months ago, um, actually with colleagues in Japan, and also I've been talking to Mary in Mecklenburg. Um, once I finish my silica gel work, my next project, um, which is sort of already underway, is an investigation of old versus new wood in terms of equilibrium moisture content issues as a function of temperature and humidity, as well as dimensional movement. And all I can say is in my research, I always use old wood, whether it's necessary or not, just because I'm not sure. I mean, Nate, Richard Buck said years ago that there's no difference between old buck wood and new wood. 
but I've long been one to challenge what people say like that, so we'll see. Uh, Giorgio, let's ask. Giorgio uh, Bonsanti. A couple of years ago, Leonardo da Vinci's annunciation from the Uffizi Gallery traveled to Japan, and his movements were uh, monitored and recorded through a data logger, which seemed to show that uh, stresses occurred during handling, not during the travel itself, uh, which would support the choice of the National Gallery of London, as you heard in uh, Miriam Ainsworth's excellent talk this morning, not to land the ambassadors uh, by Holbein to the Gallery. So my question is, according to your experience and opinion, is distance a parameter to be taken into account or not? Thank you. Is that directed towards a person or <laughs> the general panel? <laughs> Anyone want to leap in? Um, I guess I'm the transit person yes. here. <laughs> um, <laughs> Anyway, uh, I totally agree with what you just said in terms of where the problems um, are seen. And I've been, as most of you know, involved with the transit issues for a long time, and we too have often monitored exactly what's going on. Um, and in essence, what I try to tell people is once you get it into the packing case, I'm not worried, as long as it's a properly designed packing case. Um, the issues... Um, really have to do with all of the handling that's involved, the hustle and bustle of ex exhibition activity. Um, and potentially the two environmental issues would, would be limited to lending to another institution with a dramatically different environmental condition than you have. Um, or I still worry about long truck transports through Russia in the middle of the winter when temperatures could drop severely to very low levels and if the vehicle does not have a properly heated cargo area. That I worry about. What happens in airplanes, I don't worry about. What happens in the typical um, air ride suspension truck, I don't worry about. Um, uh, I have uh, never used it myself. I, I haven't uh, actually been designing so many microclimate frames personally, uh, but I must say that I'm very um, resistant to use of scavengers in, in very confined uh, enclosures. I don't really believe they do a lot of difference. As you saw from uh, this model, I showed first the room and then the small enclosure, you can, uh, you can imagine using a scavenger as ventilation, really. It's you, you flush away or you remove uh, a certain amount of uh, pollutants per time unit uh, as in ventilation. And what you should remember is that the source is so, so strong as compared to the uptake uh, rate in, in, in such a scavenger that it's either just uh, used up very fast or, or it has really no, um, no effect, I believe. I never me measured this, but it could be a nice little study to do someday. In the back there on the right. Um, it will, uh, do you mean how long it takes to reach these concentrations? Yeah. Uh -huh. it, it will go fast if, if, if it's a, a fairly airtight uh, frame. It will 
be a matter of a uh, few days, uh, con considering just the the, uh, the theory of these mass balances, there will fairly quickly be a steady state concentration. That doesn't mean that 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 then there's no more emission. It's just a system of both emission and resorption of the surface all the time that reaches at an equilibrium. You mean if you should open it every now and then to vent it, or? Well, uh, it's uh, I, more problematic uh, from this point of view to keep yeah. it sealed for years. Uh, no, it doesn't make any difference. In the, in the front here. My name is Harry Howlett. I'm a wood conservator, and I uh, address this to Roman Koslowski. Um, I certainly uh, to share some of some of Joyce's concerns and some of Mark's concerns, but I have another concern, and that is. I, I have difficulty understanding how um, a simple mechanical test could be analogous to what what's going on when a, a panel painting experiences uh, tremendous fluctuations in relative humidity. I mean, there's so many issues that that uh, you know make it a much more complex situation. You mentioned the equilibrium and moisture content, but there's also the fact that the physical properties will vary for any absolutely yes a, a given relative humidity. There's also the issue of, of just the, uh, the fact that when you have a panel painting um, uh, swelling, um, there's a lot going on there. It's not just simple tension. That is, you've got certain materials under tension, but you've also got uh, the wood fibers being restrained by the less responsive materi materials that they are actually under compression. And uh, convert, well, at, at the same time, when the, the moisture is then desorbed, um, if the wood has been plastically deformed, it's, it's put in tension when the panel pane then shrinks back down to size. So it, it just seems to me, I, I guess my question would be... I agree, be, yes. Uh, I comment on that. <laughs> yeah, uh, do, you, do you intend to, to it is, use yeah. this as a starting point and then go on to do the testing uh, e e using yeah. Uh, f first, I would like to go back to, to, to historic versus, versus laboratory prepared specimens. Of course, as, as I mentioned, we would like very much also to test, uh, to complement the, the laboratory testing with some historic samples, which we can use for destructive testing. So we're very much aware that we should have some bridge between, between original uh, just so, so on, on wood and, and uh, uh, laboratory specimens. Just we, we need standardized laboratory material to start the work. But, but concerning, it is a simplification, yes, you are very right that uh, uh, we doing mechanical uh, testing, we just uh, put, put gesso, strain the gesso or compress the gesso and we don't alter its physical properties because we don't change the relative humidity. It's at constant relative humidity, like 50%. But there is no choice, as I mentioned, to cycle uh, a specimen imitating a panel in microchromatic chamber would require, you could do probably a few cycles per month, which, 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 which will not bring you a fatigue function, so we pay some price simplifying the experiment but get a lot of valuable information but we would like to repeat that experiment at a different relative humidities so of course you, the average value you will have so, so you, you will see the change in the properties with changing relative humidity but we will, you will not have as you say the full interplay between properties, relative humidity cycles and so on You mean, uh, I mean, this test was limited to a very well-defined case. We have freely expanding and uh, contracting wooden support, 
and we look at what happens with physical method, what happens to the gesso layer. We believe that gesso is imitating well the historic gesso because from all we know and from especially advice we've got, uh, gesso is not aging uh, significantly. The properties of historic gesso are not very difficult from equilibrated modern, modern produced gesso and so on. And that's the limit of the experiment, I agree. And then, yes, we effectively were just mechanically testing gesso in this experiment and then looking when damage appears with uh, precise methods. Okay. Thank you. I think Arlen, you've got a comment? I would like to pass that question to Mervyn, who explained the... I, I, of course, I was dealing just with, uh, with, the, with the dimensional response in tangential direction, and the perpendicular cracking has a very different origin. So can you please comment? I mean, your, your conclusion is, is absolutely correct. Um, obviously, the actual effect or the actual crack formation that you see in various paintings is going to be very much influenced by how extreme the environment they live in. But in the longitudinal direction of wood, both thermally and um, in terms of relative humidity changes, you have minimal expansion and contraction. Everybody in here knows that. And then the radial and tangential, with the tangential being worse, you have much more. Um, if you remember the chart where I showed thermal responses and included um, the, thermal react the thermal responses of paint, for example, and I didn't have it in the graph, but we have this, the same information is available for gesso. I mean, what you'll see is that those materials are, in fact, behaving thermally and with equilibrium changes um, a pr in, the, in the realm of the same way as is the wood in the radial direction. But as soon as you look at that and compare that to what's happening longitudinally, you'll see that they're dramatically different. Therefore, you can, in fact, have the wood remaining very stable, the opposite of what we normally are thinking in our minds, while those layers on top are not. So they're moving, and as they try to expand and contract, the wood's not going with them. Um, so that all fits in with what your general conclusion was. I think, oh, um, quick comment. Quick comment. <laughs> I think we have time for one last comment, and actually I'll defer to George Bazaka to wrap things up. Uh, no, he's behind you. <laughs> Where's George? <laughs> uh, you. Yeah, uh, just to the of, uh, you speak with the microphone a little closer. Together with the 
so in one direction and, 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 and without any movement in the other direction. And so those uh, crackular lines are set up in the initial drying uh, uh, period. And uh, the reason that I think that it happens so early is also because in punch patterns, uh, the, 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 the amount of uh, cracks that, that emanate from punch points uh, on the perimeter of panels indicates that it happens at a very early stage that it's set up. And, and it's because of the fact that uh, of shrinking back uh, in one direction it doesn't happen, in the other direction it does, so it's accepted. Uh, Marion and I have actually discussed this quite a bit. And